Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our talk. My name is Cassandra Pierre, and on the call with me is Nathan Chung. We are going to be talking about neurodiversity in cybersecurity and how you can find your competitive advantage today. So thank you for joining. Wonderful. So what exactly is neurodiversity? Um, Nathan, I'll start with a definition. It's the idea that it's normal and acceptable for people to have brains that function differently from one another. Um, normally, when you hear the term neurodiversity mentioned, uh, some of the things that come to mind would be autism, ADHD, dyslexia, um, dyspraxia, Tourette's. Um, it, I would say neurodiversity is something that I think a lot of people are hearing a lot more about, I would say in the last two to three years. And um, a lot of people are sharing um, about their neuro neurodiversity and also about um, their advocacy for this uh, cause. Do you see that, Nathan, as well? Absolutely. I'm quite happy about that because no diversity always carries a negative stigma. So to see people coming out openly that they have a condition such as autism, ADHD, or Tourette's, it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely. Agreed. So the crux of our talk today is to talk about cybersecurity and then also to talk about how it can be an amazing career for people who are neurodiverse. So currently in the United States, there are many jobs that are open. Um, in May 2021, there were almost 500,000 open jobs in cybersecurity across all sub genres of the industry. Um, you know, in, in talking to a lot of people in cyber, outside of cyber, people in the black community, um, there has been conversations about how we are best preparing future generations to graduate, to go to college or not a vocational school, and then to pivot into a career. I hope we can unpack some of that today, but our primary focus is to talk about um, how we can support neurodiverse individuals and neurodiverse youth to investigate and look at cyber as a great career path. Um, some of the reasons why uh, I think cyber is an amazing career path, even for someone who may be looking at a second career, is the financial freedom that can be achieved. Uh, most of these jobs are high paying. The stability, obviously the creation of generation wealth, generational wealth, um, not only for you know, your immediate family, but you know, for your grandkids and, and, and for your surrounding family. Um, the career opportunities that come along with that, and also it's a career where you are constantly learning new technology. Um, so intellectual stimulation, if that's something that interests you, cybersecurity would be a great fit. So again, can it be an ideal career path for people of color? I believe so. Um, I think, you know, with organizations like BIC and, um, you know, other, other technology and cybersecurity organizations, um, they're laying the foundation and the framework for a lot of people to upskill and, and to pivot. Um, I think a lot of the support is there. Um, if someone is interested in pivoting to cybersecurity, it's just a matter of hooking up with the right network of people who will support and encourage you. It's not an easy pivot, but it is possible if you set your mind to it and you're willing to do the work. Um, cybersecurity, I believe, it's a great career path for um for people of color so again uh benefits of cybersecurity. um i would say one of the benefits that i've seen i'm not yet working in the field uh, nathan but i would say also is that cybersecurity has a really good community um and lots of uh, opportunities for people to um come together to share knowledge and then also to share community um, I think that's how we met, right? Absolutely. We met through uh, WESIS, and mm -hmm. and we we are both part of many, many other organizations that help do what we can to help out. <laughs> Very happy mm -hmm. with that. Yeah, I've met some really great people and, um, you know, always willing to pitch in to help, to explain 
you know, concept if I didn't understand um, to help me with interviews, so on and so forth. Uh, it's definitely a supportive uh, community and organizations like BIC makes it uh, very, very easy to uh, kind of get in and, and to, to see or to find out what um, your niche is. So here are the numbers of neurodiversity and cybersecurity. Um, Nathan, I know this is something that we've been talking about for a very long time, right? Um, neurodiversity as, you know, something that people uh, talk about right now openly, um, but also our concern about what is happening to our youth, um, specifically those who may be in special education, who have an IEP, so on and so forth. So we do know that autism in Black children has increased um, exponentially. Um, you know, back when I worked in education, I can say that uh, the support for students and for their parents really was not there, nor was um, the open-mindedness, I would say, that we see with neurodiversity as a whole. It was very stigmatized. Uh, those students were um, frequently in uh, suspended from school or in timeout. It, it was, they were often penalized instead of being provided with support. Um, I think now we see a lot of parents becoming more educated around uh, the difficulties that their children have and they're being a better advocates for their children in school. Moving along with that is, you know, the amount of black adults that um, are now getting diagnosed, right, with, with ADHD um, later on in their, in, their, in their lives and in their professional careers. Um, something that they've struggled with for a very long time and only because this conversation is is coming up um they're going and seeking a professional evaluation and a professional opinion so um i think that's a great thing because people can get the support um that they need and then you know three percent of infosec jobs are made up by african americans i think that's a dismal number um considering the the wide amount of um open roles there are um the the job recs that we see companies are advertising they have openings um why we as a people aren't able to connect to those openings and to land the job um that's a, a <laughs> that's a conversation for another day but it's definitely something that um i think in my position uh you know, not only in tech development, but also uh, with other organization affiliates. It's something that I want to look into more um, to see how we can open more doors for people to to pivot. Um, so, what about uh, what do you, what about students who are studying STEM? Um, Nathan, we see here only thirty four point three percent are studying STEM. Why do you think that is? It's very hard because, like you said, that there are a lot of barriers in it for a lot of folks, especially for women. Mm -hmm. It starts as early as middle school and high school. If they are turned away from STEM at that early age, they, they never recover. They, they just totally lose interest. So, but as a study show, there is a strong, I say, a strong indicator that a lot of people who are autistic want to go into STEM. So as much as possible, we need to encourage them and to keep keep them going because we here in the US, we there's a lot of brain drain like with a with a recession and the current global economic crisis that's going on, a lot of people probably don't even want to go to STEM. It's like they're in survival mode. So we gotta do more to encourage people to learn STEM in school and into college. Yeah, definitely agree. And as you can see, only nine percent of STEM graduates or black and and like you yes. said there are many reasons for that um it could be lack of support uh, at university level um lack of support and making the transition after graduation to a career um you know needing to maybe seek a career that has more stability or better benefits right to support a family um or to be able to connect to a salary that is um 
you know, isn't something that's going to scale up as they gain experience, but something that right out of the gate, they'll be able to, to make a living wage. So it, we have a lot of work to do, um, I think, when it comes to not only uh, neurodiverse African Americans, um, period, but also those who are interested in cyber and want to make um, a change. So uh, this is something that comes up a lot, you know, the, the pros of, of being a neurodivergent individual and um, the competitive advantages that come along with it. I'll talk about the first uh, couple, Nathan, and then I'll let you get the bottom. Um, definitely att attention to detail, um, being adept at research, having a high love for learning new things and, to finding, and, and for finding out new things. Um, highly skilled with rote and mechanical tasks, uh, being great at data entry, being great at looking at logs, um, being great at looking at, um, you know, uh, research papers and whatnot. Uh, I think uh, people who are neurodiverse come with a specific set of skills that make them highly, highly uh, skilled and a great fit. Um, not only for cyber roles, but for many roles. Um, it's just a matter of finding the right job, the right support system. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, you want to talk about the the last four, Nathan? Sure, absolutely. And um, for the the uh, people who, who are neurodivergent, they also have superior long term memory recall. They can, for example, listen to uh, like like uh, something. They can memorize specific dates and they can just spot on. They can just tell you exact date, exact numbers. Like, like wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they also have an affinity for logic, math, and pattern recognition. Tremendously useful for instant response where you need to be able to identify potential hackers or nation state attackers as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Picture and out of the box thinkers. Sometimes to be really good security, you need to go to think out of the box and think like a hacker and especially for certain tasks like malware analysis or threat hunting where you need to be able to think out of the box like what what will the hack will the pen testers or hackers try to do what would they do inside the system if they're getting mm -hmm. and lastly most importantly is innovation and creative problem solvers super reliable in especially in incident response because in a crisis, a lot of a lot of people who are neurodivergent are very they, they go into overdrive and they can mm -hmm. they can solve their incidents a lot faster than other folks. Yeah, that's that mm -hmm. hyper focus, right? That, hyper focus. That, yes. uh, that uh, moment when you can uh, essentially you fixate on a task until you can remedy it, um, and yep. you get uh, you get the um, desired outcome or solution that you want. Awesome. So I guess this is a point in the conversation where, you know, for those of you who are listening or watching, after all that we've said, do you think that cyber could be the right career for you? Um, is this your first time hearing about cyber and, and, not, and, you know, the possibility of you making a pivot? Have you thought about it before? What do you think would make, um, what about you do you think would make you an ideal candidate? Um, what skill set do you currently have that could either be honed or developed? What are the soft skills that you have um, that are your competitive advantage? Um, how would someone, right, who traditionally, I would say, in a job or in a role or in another uh, environment who doesn't traditionally fit in, find their space or find their place in cyber? And then what skills do you have that set you apart and make you different um, from everyone else? And how can you highlight those um, to maximize your strengths. We're going to get into that. So I'll share a little bit about myself. Um, like I said, I've been, um, I guess, cyber adjacent, that's the best way to put it, um, for the last two and a half years or so. Um, I had the uh, privilege of uh, working um, initially with BIC and being a part of their uh, community, uh, meeting some really great people there leveraging their resources, getting on their Discord channel, um, met lots of friendly people. And this is one of the reasons why um, I thought it was really important for us to bring this uh, information to 
um, to DEF CON. So again, a cyber and technology enthusiast. I love anything tech, um, love to tinker with different things. On top of that, um, I have about, I would say 15 years, 10 years or so, experience working in mental health, both in special education um, with uh, children up to age uh, 18, and then also adults in an acute psychiatric setting. Um, so I bring my love for mental health and psychology um, to my work and, you know, day to day, I try to uh, spread information about mental health awareness and um, physical wellness, stress reduction, that kind of thing. Um, one, one interesting thing about me also is my intersectionalities, right? Um, I'm obviously a Black female um, from the Caribbean, and I received a very late diagnosis um, about three years ago. Um, I've been, you know, in and out of therapy uh, for a very long time. It's something that I actively sought out because I think it's important for you to really have a space, a safe space where you can talk about, you know, things that are bothering you. But um, at my age now, this is something that was missed all of these years. It was just an eccentricity, right, that people um, thought that I had or that I was dealing with and I was misdiagnosed for a very very, very, very long time. Um, par partially, I think, because of the lack of research that's out there for women, uh, specifically Black women, um, and also because of, you know, a lot of, of mental health practitioners are not of color. So it's very difficult to find um, someone who gets you and can help you, you know, kind of figure out what's going on with you. So as a result of that, I've made it my mission right now to really reach out and to, one, share my story about what I go through um, as someone who is neurodivergent, dealing with, you know, ADHD and um, spectrum issues and, you know, really advocating for people who are younger than me, um, who are graduating, who are transi transitioning into college, you know, trying to figure out what their career is. Um, providing them with the support so they kind of don't have to go through a lot of the hardships that I did. Um, and I think that's what really encourages me. And also, finally, I'm also the um, president and one of the founders of uh, the WESIS Neurodiversity Affiliate. We just started a couple months ago. We have a lot of great things coming. Um, but this is just one of the things that I think Nathan and I have been plotting about for the last uh, couple of, of months um, to really solidify and to start to create a place where people like us uh, can be safe, can find information, um, and also explore a career in cybersecurity. Yep, I can't hear you, Nathan. You muted? Oh, sorry. Uh, there you go. <laughs> so similar to Cassandra, so I, ha so I have autism ADHD and I'm also late diagnosed. I just got diagnosed in 2021. I've been working in cybersecurity and IT for more than 20 plus years. I'm also host of the Neurosec podcast. I'm advisor to and former leader of the WESIS No Diversity Affiliate. And I'm happy of the, all the work that Cassandra and others are, are doing. Yeah, next slide. Awesome. And here are some amazing w women in cybersecurity who are new, openly neurodivergent. Uh, Tia Hopkins, she's a CTO and adjunct professor and multi-award winner. Stephanie I, she's a security engineer. And Samantha Noamani, she's a cybersecurity intern. Uh, next slide. Awesome. And here's something which a lot of people don't realize. Uh, we are living through a lot of history of amazing uh, black uh black people uh, amazing people of color throughout our history one example tom wiggins he's a blind musician he was a blind musician he said to be the highest paid pianist of the 19th century mark mm -hmm. twain once said that his skills to pass multi-art rihanna clark olympian she set multiple world records in track and field lauren rochelle fernandez she is the founder of mask off working to educate and destigmatize neurodiversity and mental health. Avery Amer, TikTok influencer, mm -hmm. talks about autism. He has 60,000 followers. Mm -hmm. Lamar Hardwit, he's an autism advocate, pastor, and author. Talia Grant, she's the first autistic actress on a mainstream British TV show. 
Morgan Harper Nichols. He's a writer, artist, storyteller, and social media influencer. And my favorite of on this on this slide is Will Smith, great looking guy, actor, <laughs> and he's he's openly has ADHD. <laughs> awesome. I love this slide. Love it. So um, we're gonna make a, a quick pivot to talking about uh, neurodiversity in the workplace and uh, some of the tips, tricks, and strategies that employers can implement to ensure that they are providing for a very smooth and inclusive recruiting process for um, neurodiverse employees, or hire, new hires, um, and accommodations that they can create for them. Nathan, do you want to start with this? Sure. So, for some, some recruitment best practices, it starts with the job description. It's important and critical to have inclusive language. I've just seen way too many job descriptions over the years that say it's something like, gotta be team player. Just words like that discourage people like, uh, like me from you know, applying. Number two, provide interview questions in advance. I had that in my last employer and that made a huge difference. It took away my anxiety and made the interview much easier. Number three, ask for or even allowing accommodations during interviews, very critical. Number four, ask candidates for tools they need to thrive because everyone is different. Everyone has different needs. So you just got to ask them what what do they need and also most importantly provide remote or flexible interview options because the old school in-person interview that's that's pretty much gone out the door and for people like myself i do so much better with the remote interviews so much better agreed <laughs> <laughs> definitely agreed with that I will also let you get into this one. Um, uh, sure. Nathan, I love the fact that you made a great um, distinction between <laughs> ideals and less ideal roles for, for neurodiverse yeah, workers. Dang, so sure. jump into that. So for a lot of people who are neurodiversion, ideally you want a, a more technical role, but I do stress again, everyone's different. But for me and a lot of people like me, we thrive in very technical, fields where there's less human interaction, like for example, threat hunter, forensic analyst, incident response, malware engineer, penetration tester, and consultant. Now, the advantage of a lot of these jobs is you're essentially once you get in a zone and you're hyper focused, you can do an amazing job. You can think specialists. A specialist in these fields fields especially can do an amazing thing just it's harder if you get distracted by all oh, this have a meeting let's talk to people then it becomes a lot harder so that's why the inverse is less ideal jobs would be like security project manager or privacy officer security auditor or compliance risk manager those jobs i've i've done a lot many of those jobs before and it can be very stressful especially in many many meetings that go on forever and ever it's Fills me with anxiety and equals to a uh, mental burnout a lot quicker. Definitely, um, it, like you said, the back-to-back -back meetings, you know, constant interaction with people that pull you out of your uh, zone of, of um, concentration, um, and and just overall cognitive uh, burnout. And you know, if this is something that goes on day by day by day, it can be very detrimental um, to you know an employee who wants to create a, a a career that will grow right and where they can be promoted. So it's very important for you to think about um, you know when you're choosing what role or what area of cyber is a good fit for you. Also choose also also think about what your day to day in a, your role may look like. If you don't really know, this is when you kind of need to reach out to your network, get on Discord channels, you know, find people who are currently in that role and ask them about what their, you know, job is like, what they do for a day, um, you know, day to day, you know, how they trained, um, 
and see if those are the things that that fit well for you. Um, I think talking to real people about what they do is the best way to find out if a role is for you or not. So there are a lot of accommodations that employers can provide either during the hiring process or once a new hire has onboarded um, supports that they can uh, provide to their employee to ensure that they can do their job to the best of their ability. I hope that one day we will move from calling these accommodations and they're just readily available things that people have that they don't have to ask for. So interview questions made it available in advance. I also had an opportunity um, to interview and was provided with questions in advance. And it made, um, like Nathan said, it, it really removed a lot of the anxiety that people feel um, when it comes to being able to uh, perform on the spot. Noise reducing headphones. I have a, a pair on my on my desk. These are important, especially if you work, you may work in a in an open floor plan office, or even if you're at home, it's good to cut the noise out, um, you know, that may uh, distract you. Being able to work from home or having uh, maybe one or two days in the office and working remotely, um, flexible schedule. Some of us work better early in the morning and need to take a, a rest or, or, you know, during the day and then log back on at the end of the night to kind of finish things up. That gives you an opportunity to really keep an eye on your um, energy levels and um, to ensure that you're not pushing yourself to the max and, and leading to you know, uh, patterns of burnout. That's something that you don't wanna have. Captions or transcriptions, definitely very helpful, um, especially if you have meetings back to back. It, it detracts from the cognitive overload when you can just look at the text on a screen as opposed to trying to differentiate voices from background noise, from clicks from people chewing, from people laughing, the dog barking, all of those things. Um, these are the reasons why those things are important. And last but not least, ergonomic furniture. We also, you know, we talk a lot about our mental health. Taking care of our physical body is also very important. Um, with a cyber role, most of them, you will be sitting at a desk for most of the day. So get a stand-up desk, you know, ask for an ergonomic chair that is supporting um, your feet, uh, foot rests, all of these things. When you put the totality of all of these things together, it provides you or can provide you with the support that you need to be fully functional um, at work. So just a couple of things, Nathan, I'll let you uh, jump in because I think you have a lot of great things to add here. Um, when it comes to retention, you know, I think a lot of times we don't really think about, you know, the employees that don't really say much, right? And then when they leave, we want to know why they left. Um, they were such a great worker. Why did they leave? Um, I think a lot of times employers don't really try to implement a solution until people actually leave the job. So these are some of the things that employers can do uh, starting today to ensure that um, they're creating a safe space for their employees. Listen, if people are going to um, put themselves out there to share insights about things that can be improved. Listen to what they have to say. It may not um, mesh or go well, or maybe you do not want to hear what they have to say, but understand people are putting themselves on the line to share um, their feelings. Give them their accommodations. If they request you know, the fact that they would like a flexible schedule and it is a reasonable accommodation, it does not disrupt you know, work, provide that to them. You'll find that they become even more productive and um, even you know, better at doing their job um, you know, the job that they signed up for, flexible career paths. A lot of us are multi-potential, meaning that we are, we have multiple interests um, in many different areas, right? So we may get into a role, you see this a lot of, with people who um, have ADHD, they have a lot of interest and a lot of intellectual strength in many areas, um, provide them with the opportunity to start new projects or you know to work on a different engagement or to go on a tour of duty these are the things that keep people engaged and um interested in their work you want to finish these up nathan sure and to add to what you said about switch about career path a lot of businesses they still have it i would call it an old school mentality where you're automatically pushed into the manager slash executive ranks Whereas 
lot of people like me specifically, I have zero desire to be a manager because of the, all the social, the social uh, issues and the mental overload brings. So ideally, you want to have a flexible career path. So example, if you don't want to be a manager, you can do an should both have the choice to go an alternate path, which is architect and not interact with as many people. Barry, next, you want to reduce the barriers to productivity. You want to make the your employees feel very comfortable to do their job. Next, incorporate DEI to corporate culture because at many organizations they try to add it like add something like put put something temporary on top of your corporate culture. I, but ideally, these DEI initiatives for, around no diversity should be applied organization wide so that everyone feels welcome. Definitely. Next. Address the stigma issues immediately because despite all the gains of new diversity, it is still like a return, it gets a bad rap. People where people immediately if as if they, they if people see you as having like autism or ADHD, you get labeled and sometimes then most more times than not, the label are like you're a problem, you're quirky, you're strange, and it's it's almost always negative. Mm -hmm. So when this happens, this negative stigma, especially, you need to be able to like essentially stomp it out and make people feel welcome. So the burden of this, especially on managers, like when you see stuff happen, speak up, take action. And most important of all, be an ally to your employee because a lot of people are going to be quiet. They're going to be quiet. They just want to do their work. Don't wait for them to come to you. As in, for managers especially, reach out to your employees, ask them straight off, how are you doing? What can I provide to you that can help you to thrive? And that one question crosses many boundaries, not just no diverse employees, but men, women, people of color, various races, age, LGBTQ+, that one question takes care of all of that. Just ask your employees, what do you need? Yeah, that's awesome. And and is it is really needed building a rapport with your employees is so important, especially now with with so much going on. So here are some tips for employees. Um, if you're looking at uh, maybe making a pivot into cyber, here's a couple things that you should keep in mind um, as you go down this path. So again, having some self awareness, right? thinking about what exactly you want and how you um, will get there. What is the path for you to get to your end goal? What's the ideal role that you want? Do you have the experience, the skills, the education, or even the ability to get the job? If you don't currently, find that job description on Indeed or Glassdoor or whatever. Take a look at what is required. What are the skills needed for you to, um, you know, to be able to do the job and then work towards that. How do you work best? Virtually, in person, hybrid. Personally, I work best at home. Um, I'm more productive at home. I can control my environment, do what works for you. Do you want to share um, about the, you know, about being your divergent? Do you want to keep that to yourself? How much would you share? Well, who do you share it with? Your manager, HR, whoever, this is something that you need to know. Um, if you need specific accommodations, write those down, think about them, do some research so you know what to ask for. What do you need and how will it be able to support you to do your job better? Who's on your team? I think it's very important for everyone to have a mentor who can provide them with um, the technical uh, information about the job that they're in, a coach who will help you to plot out your career long term and to provide you with feedback on your performance and how you're doing and how you're growing as a person and as a professional. And then also counsel your therapist, your psychiatrist. They can help you with some of the more meaty uh, issues of anxiety, depression, um, things like that that may really derail uh, your professional progress if you don't focus on it and deal with it. Find someone to talk to that can provide you with professional feedback. And then how can you supplement your skills? Is there a specific certification that you wanna take? Um, if so, get into a study group. BIC has a bunch of uh, study groups and cert uh, prep and 
you know, uh, programs that can help you uh, get on the path to finding the job that you want, the role that you want. So definitely continue to connect with them for, for guidance. Find your fit. There are some jobs that will not be a good fit for you. Okay, if a role is, you know, back-to-back -back meetings, heavy client contact, that may not be the place for you. It sure isn't the place for me. So figure out what you want and what you don't want. Have you reached out to people that work for the company that you may be interviewing for? Find them on LinkedIn, reach out to someone, ask them about the culture at that company, look up the person who is on the hiring panel, find out information about them, do your OSINT on your job, on your new role, because all of this information is going to be important for you to make a decision if this is the right place for you. Contingency plan, if you're going through a difficult time, what can you do to ensure that you can successfully do your job while getting the support that you need, be it mental health, physical health, whatever. Know who you have that in your life that can support you and um, ensure that you keep them, that you're open with them about how you're doing and where you are. Um, I find for interviews, something that I do is uh, research interview questions for the specific role. And then I do a lot of practice. I usually rope my sisters into being my, my interview panel and um, they interview me, ask me questions, that kind of thing. It has helped over time to reduce a lot of my anxiety when it comes to interviewing. Highlight your strengths. It's not bragging. If you know that you are a great problem solver, if you're a strong writer, if you are a great pen tester, speak up about what you are good at. It doesn't make you a bragging person. It makes you someone who's confident and knows what you are good at. Um, Sometimes you may get a no. Sometimes you may, you know, really do awesome in an interview and then you get that, you get that email that they did not choose you. Yes, it's extremely disappointing when that happens, but do know that every step that you make towards your new role is building resilience. You are gaining experience. You're gaining an understanding of the industry and use that for the next time. And lastly, find your support system. How can the people around you support you? Let them know what you're going through. Let them know what your goal is and um, actively ask them to support you as you uh, make your way towards it. I'm gonna go through these quickly, just six things that you can do um, to work towards where you wanna go professionally. And I think these apply to everyone. Um, neurodivergent or not, you must have a plan. Got to know where you're going um, and how you're going to get there. If you don't know where you're going, it's very difficult to come up with a plan that's going to work. Take a take a piece of paper or use a spreadsheet. Write down all the trainings you've been through, conferences like this one, um, courses that you've taken on LinkedIn or wherever your certs. Keep them on a piece of paper or keep them somewhere visible so you can see how you are making progress. Um, towards your goal. It may seem like getting to where you want to go is taking forever, but you've accomplished a lot. Give yourself credit for that. The second thing is to prepare. Have a plan and then prepare to put it in practice. If you don't have your support system, the resources you need, an accountability buddy, someone who's going to ask you how you know your cert prep went, um, and a system to succeed, it's gonna be very difficult for you to see progress and to push forward. If you are making small wins and you are hitting your, your, your small goals, it's going to boost your confidence and propel you further towards um, where you wanna end up. Definitely protect yourself. I think this kind of goes along with um, the overall mental health conversation, Nathan, right? Um, create a plan to maintain work-life balance that's sustainable. I think we all have a tendency to take on a lot more on our plate than we are capable of. Be aware if that's something that you, you tend to do, be aware of that and ensure that you have uh, blockers in place to, to, to know when to put up a boundary and to say no, that your plate is full. Um, pay attention to your physical health, work out a couple days a week, stretch in the morning, do some yoga, go for walks, go to your therapy appointments, make sure there's a professional 
um, in your life that can provide you with the support that you need. Uh, the community also has tons of support groups that you can attend now virtually, which, which is awesome. Work is not everything. How, try to have a social life. Um, you don't have to be out in the club every weekend, but, you know, go to a, go to a park, you know, have lunch with your friends, um, do the things that fill you back up and, and, you know, really reduce the level of stress that you are experiencing. Cybersecurity is a very, very stressful um, industry and a lot of people right now are, are experiencing burnout. If this is the path that you want to take, do get, get in the habit of creating these positive um, patterns now. Find your friends, you could other things, pick up hobbies, um, make sure that you are protecting yourself. Play up your strengths. Again, what is your competitive advantage? Are you a problem solver? Are you good at finding patterns? Are you good at um, your strong writer? All of these things are uh, skills that you should be speaking up in your interviews and when you make connections via networking. That's your brand. You wanna be the go-to person on your team currently. Um, for that thing that you do well. So when you go into that interview, you, you can name the skill, you can name the action, you can name how you implemented the skill and what the positive outcomes was. Um, leverage your talents in those situations and commit to growing them. Plan for your vulnerabilities. Again, if you need rest, if you're feeling burnout for, if for you know, you're overworked or you're not feeling well physically, ask for a day off take a mental health day it doesn't make you a slacker it makes you a smart person um, if your environment at work is stressing you out open floor plans you don't have a quiet place to work um, physically you're uncomfortable find a work environment or ask for one that's going to help you do your job better if you need um, support at work uh, to get your work done and and to feel like you are bringing your best self to work every day speak to your manager if you're not um you know you, you really don't want to speak to that person reach out to hr see what is available for you also leverage your affinity network so disability groups um you know there are a lot we have uh african-american groups um latina groups whatever groups there are uh, located at your job reach out to them and ask around find out what's available that you could tap into um, that you could pull in to, to support you. And then lastly, persevere. I think um, a lot of us have gone through uh, extreme hardship, um, especially if you were later diagnosed, right? Because you may have thought that there was something wrong with you. Um, there wasn't anything wrong. It's just that you do things differently. Remember that, right? You process and think differently and that's it, okay? This looks very different for lots of different people. Find out what that means for you, find out what your thing is, and know how to apply yourself in a situation in order to be productive, and then keep it moving. Don't allow naysayers to get in your head or in your way. I think sometimes we get caught up on labels and we focus too much on those, hyper-focus, Nathan, and, um, you know, it puts us in a very bad headspace. So really, you know, write your goals down, keep it in a place where you can see them, keep studying, you know, connect with people who are positive, reach out to folks who are either in your network, outside your network, in that job that you want to get, um, ask them about themselves, ask them to mentor you, um, display your knowledge, start a blog, write on LinkedIn, become a content creator, talk about building a virtual lab. There are plenty of people who want to pivot into cyber that can use um, the knowledge that you already have. Join them, work on projects, give back, find someone to mentor. Um, it's, it's about that time of year where people are either going back to the school or they just, or they just recently um, graduated. Find someone who all has similar goals to you and mentor them or volunteer. And I've also found that um, the best way for me to uh, integrate a new concept or to comprehend exactly what it is I need to learn is to teach someone else. I do my studying and then I share that information. If you can effectively teach someone a concept, that means it's stuck in your head. So definitely do that. Keep moving. And if you get a no, keep pushing forward because your yes is around the, the corner. It's coming.
here are a few resources that we've compiled for you all um that are very helpful the first one obviously being the newer set podcast that Nate <laughs> post <laughs> um hopefully uh, we're gonna see lots uh many many more episodes of of the podcast coming up and then the second and the third are two amazing sites blocks and cybersecurity. thank you so much for this opportunity to be able yeah. to share with you yep, um, thank you the big is doing an amazing thing in the community and um, is providing a, a well-needed uh, place, safe space uh, for people to learn, to network, to grow, and then to find and connect to great careers. So um, it's been a pleasure to be here and to um, share a little bit uh, with you on this topic. Um, thank you, Vic, for having us. Yep, thank and you. Uh, if you need to reach out to us, you definitely can find Nathan and I on LinkedIn. Um, we will be able to share our information um, with Vic and uh, LinkedIn, Neurosec Podcast, Wesis, Vic, we're out there. Definitely reach out. Thank you so much. Thank you. So.